Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs. David, nice to see you. Nice to see you, Andy. Happy to be with you. Let's start by uh, talking about the firm and giving us a snapshot right now, David. Where do things stand? We're between quarters right now. First quarter, you talked about lowering growth expectations. Earnings were down. You beat expectations, but obviously you have headwinds with higher rates in the banking sector. So tell us where things are right now. We're, we're very, very focused on serving our clients. I think we've got a very, very strong client franchise, uh, particularly in our, our strong core business of banking and global markets. Uh, we laid out clearly at our investor day at the end of February uh, that we really have three key things that we're focused on. We're focused on our continuing journey to expand our client franchise and our core business, to grow our market shares and our wallet shares and banking and markets as we serve our clients there, and to grow the financing activity we have to support those clients' activities, which has been very important to our strategy. Second, we're extremely focused on the growth of our asset and wealth management platform, in particular the journey of reducing our balance sheet investing and continuing to raise significant capital from institutional clients. Uh, we've set a management fee target that we're on track to meet you know, sometime in the near future. Uh, of $10 billion of management fees. And we set out in our investor day some targets around margins and the growth of that business uh, that we feel that, um, that we're working hard to execute on over the course of the next couple of years. And then third, bringing our small platform businesses, which is a small part of the firm, to profitability. And so we're executing on those. I think this environment, I wouldn't call this a top quartile environment for a capital markets focused you know, banking institution, but still it's not in my 40 years in the business, there have been environments that are certainly much more challenging. And our clients are active. We're very close to our clients. And we're continuing to move the strategy of the firm forward. Yeah, let's delve a little bit more into the strategic direction. Does this entail expanding asset and wealth management by perhaps acquisitions? And also, are you looking to rationalize sales and trading and banking by consolidation internally? On, on the second point, the reason that we put our banking and markets businesses together we had operated them separately for a long time. Is everybody, there, there are two principal reasons for doing that. Everybody that we're metric against has operated those businesses as a single unit. And so one of the things that I think is important is to be able to show our businesses on a relative basis to others that we compete against. And so that structure allows us to do that. But I think the more important thing, and what really drove it from a strategic perspective, is we've seen an increasing complexity in the needs of our clients across both banking services and FIC and equity services. And in the context of the way the client base has evolved, by coordinating these businesses more directly, we think we can serve our clients better. And so we've been very, very focused over the last couple of years on our ethos of 1GS, which has really been geared at really making sure that our clients get an experience with the firm that really meets their needs broadly in a coordinated fashion, that they get access to the resources they need across the firm. And we're getting very, very positive feedback from clients on this. And bringing those two big businesses together, which so many of our clients you know, work between and across uh, throughout their activities, we've been able to strengthen that client connectivity. And we think that's really positive for the franchise, for our market shares, and most importantly, for our clients' experience. I know if our clients, if, if we build trust with our clients and they also have a great experience working with the firm, if they think we're really delivering for them, I know good things will happen over time. Yes, yeah, part of this also creating an earnings stream that is less volatile. Well, in the asset management business, Obviously, growing management fees, you know, adds to the ballast of the firm. There's no question management fees are more reliable. Management fees get a higher multiple. So with respect to asset wealth management, we're extremely focused on growing the business. You know, you, you asked, and most of that growth has been organic. Um, about a year ago, we closed on an acquisition in Europe um, that doubled the size of our traditional asset management business in Europe. We added about $300 billion of assets in that acquisition. But as we look forward, we think we've got a very, very good organic growth story mm -hmm. to grow the business by kind of high single digits and to bring the margins as we rationalize the balance sheet into the mid-20s. And we laid that out clearly in our investor day, and we're on that journey, and we're going to continue to execute against that. If we found an interesting um, inorganic opportunity that could accelerate that journey, we'd certainly consider it. You know, I just say, you know, really high quality franchises in the asset or wealth management space, you, 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 they, they have to be sold. You don't get to buy them. They're not often for sale. Um, and so, you know, you can't pick and choose when that can happen. But we, you know, we'll always consider things that we think will benefit our shareholders over time and always try to take appropriate action. Part of this restructuring, if you will, or refocusing uh, 
the priorities of the firm has been a retrenchment when it comes to the consumer business. Now, I know you're going to tell me it's a small part of the business, but on the other hand, you did spend billions of dollars there um, and you've been writing down some of those uh, parts of the business. And I know you're looking to uh, sell Green Sky now, which is a uh, fintech in the consumer loan business. Any new developments there that you want to share with us? There are no new developments there. I mean, it is a small part of the business. It's about three, three and a half percent of our capital uh, and equivalently on our revenues. We've narrowed the focus of that business uh, to really focus, first of all, on deposit taking. It's been hugely successful and very important for the firm because the firm's really been able to diversify its funding sources over the last five years by building a very, very successful deposit platform. Um, and we obviously are focused on our two credit card partnerships, but we've narrowed our direct-to-consumer interest at this point in time. And we're moving forward with an execution on that. And we think it's the right place for the firm to be at this moment in time. Let's shift and talk about macroeconomic conditions, David. And obviously, right now, banking is front and center, top of mind. Um, is this a matter of the problems in the banking sector? Is it a matter of just spiking rates? Or is there something more uh, at work here, bigger problems and reforms? Are they needed, perhaps? Well, there's no question that the very, very swift change in monetary policy and the swift increase um, in the Fed's policy rate has had an implication. It's created asset liability uh, management issues and interest rate management issues for, uh, for financial institutions, not just for banks, by the way, for other, you know, for other financial players. So there's no question that's had an impact on what's going on here. But I think there are broader secular shifts that are going around around the banking system. I think one of the things that you have to step back and consider is we, you know, we've lived in a world for the last 15 years where money has been, you know, money's been, monetary policy has been very accommodative. So money's basically been free. And in the context of that, it really didn't matter where you left your money. Um, now we have a policy rate that's at five. And we're in a place in a digital banking world where people can move money with a lot less friction. And so I do think from a secular perspective, um, over time, the cost of liabilities across the banking system is increasing. There are also headwinds for midsize and regional banks that large banks have faced for a long time around technology costs, regulatory costs, et cetera, which can, uh, which can challenge or create headwinds for those business models. And so you know, I think you have to ask, we've been on a long-term journey in this country. If you go back 25 years ago, there were 13,000 banks. Today, there are a little over 4,000. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to continue to see consolidation in the banking sector. It'll be interesting to see what kind of policy decisions are made around regulation for institutions that are, say, between $100 billion of assets and $700 billion of assets. But, you know, needless to say that in an environment where your liabilities are repricing and you also have higher technology costs, um, less friction in digital banking, higher regulatory costs, scale matters, and scale makes you more competitive. And so that's certainly going to be a headwind for a lot of institutions. And I, you know, I do think that if you look broadly across the industry, if you look at the larger, you know, $100 billion to trillion dollar balance sheet banks, you imagine the headwinds that exist. You know, I think there's, there's, there, there could be, without management action or change or adjustment in strategy, a couple hundred to 300 basis points of ROE erosion, you know, in this new environment based on repricing liabilities and some of the changes that exist. And I think for banks below $100 billion, it, it, the headwinds could be even, you know, even more significant. So there will have to be consolidation. There will have to be adjustment. Um, and people will have to rethink their business models. And, um, but I think that's something that's been going on for a while. And I think what happened here kind of accelerated some of that or shined a brighter light on, on the industry more broadly and some of the challenges that already were existing kind of under the covers. Should the Fed continue to hike rates next month or pause? I think the Fed's going to be data dependent. And I think it, you know, it partially depends on, you know, on the trajectory of the economy. I don't have a strong view on where they are at the moment. I'm watching the Fed debate, you know, just as you are and looking at the different opinions. I, um, you know, I personally think that inflation is going to be a little bit stickier. And I haven't been in the same place the market's been about a decline in rates as you go out to the end of 23, you know, into 2024. Uh, but we'll have to watch, watch and see. You know, I think I would say that it's uncertain, the path of monetary policy from here, and the markets are responding accordingly because it is uncertain. What are your customers telling you about economic conditions? What are CEOs saying to you about possible recession, for instance? The CEOs are cautious right now. And it's, you know, it's reflected in capital markets activity. It's reflected in M&A activity. CEOs are cautious, have had both, you know, headwinds and tailwinds over the course of the last, uh, over the course of the last mm -hmm. 12 months. 
But as they look forward, I think most CEOs fall into the category of saying, we're watching the Fed tighten economic conditions. We have had quite a bit of pricing power given the inflation that's existed, but some of that pricing power is certainly going to be rolled back as we look forward. I think they're concerned about margins you know, in their businesses and whether or not they're going to be able to maintain the margins that they've had. And so I think they're operating a little bit more cautiously. And I think they think it's an uncertain period and they'd like more clarity around the trajectory of economic activity through the rest of the year into 24, you know, as they think about bigger strategic decisions. David, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you a few questions about some stories out there about you and the firm. And the first set of stories concerns some of your outside activities like DJing and the fact that you received rights to use a song from a uh, Goldman client, real estate that you were doing business, involved in a real estate firm, also a Goldman client, flying on the Goldman planes. Yes, you, re- you reimburse the firm for that. But my question is uh, twofold. One, does this send the right signal? What, is, what sort of signal does it send to employees, for instance? And is it really worth the blowback that you get, for instance, in these cases? Well, I, I'm very focused on Goldman Sachs, Andy. I, I, I think there's hardly anybody that knows me that doesn't think I don't spend the overwhelming majority of my time focused on my work in Goldman Sachs. Um, I've got a few hobbies. DJing happens to get some attention, but I also like to play golf. I also like to road bike when the weather's nice. Um, I kite surf. Um, so I have interest in activities. I think most of my employees, most of the people who work for Goldman Sachs, have interests in hobbies and things they like to do. I actually think it's healthy to have some outside distractions. Um, do, do you have outside interests or hobbies? Do you do you pursue other things, or do you only work on reporting? Or are they, what are you interested in? All I do is work. Well, no, yeah. I do as well. Yeah. So I mean, we all do. So I I, I don't. Um, mm-hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue. But there's a blending. There's a blending, some people say, between those activities and Goldman work, though. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a blending. I think I work very, very hard for Goldman Sachs, and I have some, I have some outside interests. I don't, um, I don't see a blending. Um, I, I do invest in things outside the firm. Um, I think most people invest in things outside of their own, outside of their own business. Uh, we have very, very um, complex, as all financial institutions do, compliance procedures for any investment you make or any outside activity that you're involved in. I'm focused on Goldman Sachs. I am extremely focused on making sure we deliver for shareholders and for our clients for Goldman Sachs. Um, and um, and so, you know, I read the press. I, I, I wish people would focus on Goldman Sachs, uh, but I'm going to continue to focus on Goldman Sachs. But I'm going to have some outside interests because I'm a human being like anyone running any of these institutions. Another question I, I have to ask you is about Kathy Rumler, who is the general counsel of Goldman Sachs. And I'm, I'm wondering if you have full confidence in her, given disclosures about business relationship that she had with Jeffrey Epstein prior to her coming to Goldman Sachs. Kathy, uh, Kathy worked in the private sector as a, as a litigator for another firm. Uh, Kathy's always been very upfront with us when we interviewed her and we brought her to the firm. She was very upfront with us with respect to all the relationships that he has. And she's been a great general counsel. She gives great advice. I've got confidence in her. Okay. And then final question in this vein, David. Some of these news stories, some of the sources for these news stories seem to be high-level employees or partners at Goldman Sachs. And I'm wondering if you feel that you have full support from the partnership. And if the partnership, um, yes, it's important to retain and attract super talented people, but if it somehow hinders your management of Goldman Sachs? I don't think the partnership hinders my management of Goldman Sachs at all. I think one of the great attributes of Goldman Sachs is we run a big, big company, but we've managed, unlike any other institution, to keep this partnership culture, which we think is very, very important to our ability to work together, to collaborate, to serve our clients, and we invest heavily in it. I'm investing heavily in it with the rest of the leadership team to make sure we reinforce it. We think it's very, very important for the firm. There are 400 partners, approximately 400 partners at Goldman Sachs. I, uh, I assure you that there are some that don't, don't like everything that I do or every decision that I make. You know, but I'd be surprised if you could find 400 people in any organization that have a unanimous point of view about the way the organizations run or the leadership. I, you know, I take my feedback, of course, I listen to the feedback from all you know, constituencies and stakeholders, but we're, we're focused on an evolution at the firm that allows us to drive higher returns for shareholders, and we're executing on it. And along the way, that's forced us to make some changes, candidly, some changes in the way things are done, and not everybody likes change. And, um, but I, I think overwhelmingly, um, the partnership of Goldman Sachs is aligned on the strategy and is helping us drive it forward. And 
the biggest thing that I always listen to is what's coming back from our clients and the feedback from our clients around the way the partners and the whole organization is serving them, you know, has, has, has continued to be very, very strong. And so that gives me solace that we're doing the right things and, and making the right decisions. Shifting gears here, David, what is the thesis for owning Goldman Sachs stock going forward? Right now, the stock is selling for just slightly more than book. You have a fairly low multiple. So the stock is maybe inexpensive, but maybe there's more to it than that. I hope there's more to it than that, but I, I, I think that if you really want to understand the thesis for why people own the stock, you should talk to our investors. Um, mm-hmm. And our investors are extremely focused on a handful of things. And, and most of these I've touched on with you as we, you know, as we started the conversation. First, they, they are very, very impressed by the leading position of our banking and markets business and the wallet share gains that we've made in that business and the lifting of kind of the floor on returns you know, through most environments in the cycle. We've really strengthened the business. Um, and they feel we're well positioned to continue to uh, to do that and continue to grow that business. But I think the big the big strategic shift that investors are focused on that they think is very compelling and will lead to a value unlock for the stock is around our growth of the asset and wealth management platform and the change in the strategy to move from a very balance sheet intensive strategy. We used an awful lot of capital to reduce the capital in that business, which drives a higher margin, higher return business. And we've laid out a plan to do that. I think if you talk to the investors that um, that are that are in the stock and the way they look at the stock, they think that's a they think that's a very appropriate direction for the firm to take, and they think we're executing on it, and they think that it will have a very positive impact both on the overall base returns for the firm, and you know also ultimately at some point on you know how the market looks at the multiple of our earnings. I think the firm you know the firm has proven over a long period of time in different environments that we can make a lot of money in different environments and produce reasonable returns. I think over time. With that, with that mix shift in the growth in the asset management business, that will become more apparent. And follow-up question, your, your stock has done really well since you became CEO in October of 2018. You've outperformed the bank index, outperformed the S&P 500. You have trailed your arch rival, Morgan Stanley, which has a higher multiple and higher price to book. Why is that? And how do you plan to close that gap? Well, first of all, I, I didn't know that Morgan Stanley was our arch rival. Morgan Stanley is a historical institution. We, arch rival. We, uh, you know, we compete with them. We compete with a number of institutions. Um, they've done a very, very nice job growing their wealth management business and making their wealth management business a um, a bigger part of the um, of their organization. Um, and they've gotten a re-rating for it. I, I really admire what James Gorman's done and what he's accomplished over the course of the last 12 or 13 years. We're in four or five years into a strategic evolution, particularly around our asset and wealth management business. And just as I laid out a couple of moments to you, I think that if we execute on that, you know, over time, you know, hopefully the market will recognize it. Final question, David. What is the takeaway, the, the, the biggest takeaway for your constituencies, which is to say employees, customers, and shareholders? What is it you'd like to tell them that they should most listen to? You know, I, I, I don't think, Andy, that there's, there's something that's really, you know, complicated here. Goldman Sachs's fundamental strength is the trust that we earn from our clients, the quality of our people. We have really, really excellent people. The quality of the the services that we provide. If we take a long-term view, build trust with our clients, and really bring execution excellence to what we do with them, we serve them well, the firm will do just fine. And we have been focused on that. We'll continue to be focused on that. Now, in doing that, we have to make strategic alignment adjustments and decisions around you know, the businesses that we're in and how we think those businesses can steward our capital to deliver for shareholders. And as I've, you know, I've tried to kind of talk you through, we've got a very, very clear plan and articulation around the two primary things we think that are going to drive that, our banking and markets platform, we're a leader, and the shift in strategy and asset and wealth management. And we're committed to executing on that. I think that will continue to lift the base returns of the firm over time. And if we do that and continue to serve our clients well, I think the franchise, which has been around for 153 years, will continue to grow and will continue to to perform well. David Salman, CEO of Goldman Sachs, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it, Andy. You've been watching at Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.